Okay, so yeah, it works. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Edgar Iglesias. I'll be talking today about how we at AMD and Xilinx use QMU and open source technologies to do uh, RTL code simulation. Yeah, so I'm Edgar. I um, been with Xilinx and moved on to AMD through the acquisition that just happened. And I, uh, I manage the QMU or virtual platforms team at AMD. Um, okay, so first I'll start with uh, going through how we use QMU at AMD Xilinx. And this is mostly applying to the Xilinx sort of legacy stuff. Uh, AMD teams uh, may do things a little bit different. Um, then we're gonna talk about different emulation technologies that are usually used in sort of SOC development. Uh, what is co-simulation and why and how we do it? Uh, we're also gonna cover a bit what we did with the DARPA POSH program to develop some of this stuff. Uh, some more details about different co-simulation setups. And at the end we'll have a live, or I'll have a live demo, we'll see if that works. Uh, okay, so this is a slide I usually show uh, for people that don't know what QMU is, but you guys already know. But anyways, it's good to know the values and why we, we use this stuff. So uh, QMU is primarily used as a virtual platform for software developers. There are other use cases that are becoming increasingly popular, like SOC verification and validation, but the primary use is for software developers. Right, so QMU being open source, it has a very scalable distribution and cost model. What I mean with that is that it's very easy to scale up and give QMU as a platform for, um, you know, to hundreds of developers. You don't have to worry about licensing costs and stuff like that. It's also easy for us to distribute these to our customers and they can in turn distribute it to their customers. There's no issues there, right? So it scales very well. Uh, it's also popular in the open source community. So there's you know, a whole bunch of open source software projects that tend to use QMU as a platform for testing or development, right? So this is good for us to enable those communities. It's been used at Xilinx since about 2009 uh, with a whole variety of architectures, including Microblaze, the, all the ARM stuff, and also x86 setups. Um, so QMU is a sort of a transaction level emulator. It, it's very fast, but it's not cycle accurate. Uh, we'll come more to that later. Uh, it, you know, it's very fast. It can boot our ARM emulation uh, or ARM platforms into user space in a, just a couple of seconds and you know, through the whole user space into a login prompt in about a minute or maybe two, uh, depending on the setup. Um, it's got tons of debugging and profiling um, features. Uh, and we have a co-simulation framework for it, which is system C based and allows us to do sort of hybrid co-simulation setups using QMU and RTL simulation. Uh, and also to use hardware emulators and FPGA prototyping. I'll come to that in a moment. Right, and the real value is to shift the uh, software development left in the, in the program so we can start that early and get more and more stuff done earlier. So it used to be that when we, you know, when we received samples for a new SOC, we wanted to have everything ready to go on day one. Now, actually, we need to get everything going. Uh, you know, all the ports of bootloaders, firmware, kernels, that has to be done before tape out, basically. And that, you know, shifting left is, is going more and more left, right? So we need to do more and more. Um, so in terms of users, we have both internal and external users. So the main users are, uh, of course, the boot run teams. They start very early since they need to, their software needs to actually be part of the tape out, right? We have this system software teams doing, yeah, let's say operating systems, hypervisors, all of that stuff. 
system validation teams writing test cases for validating the SOCs, and the verification teams. Um, okay, so we also distribute QMU in our, let's say, tools, right, our customer-facing tools. So it's part of Peta Linux. It's also part of Vitis, and Vitis, and it goes under the name hardware emulation. And we also distribute it on GitHub for people that want to roll their own solutions. And there's actually plenty of those that take our QMU, the co-simulation framework, package it up and sell it to other customers, including to Xilinx, <laughs> which is funny. Okay. Um, so if we look at the different technologies for emulation, I just picked some here. There are, of course, more. I generalized a lot here. There are exceptions to this. Uh, but I think that the point I want to make is really that there's a spectrum of technologies and th there's a trade-off to be made, right? So we have, uh, I've color-coded um, the virtual ones with red. So what I mean with virtual is that they don't use the RTL to, to do the emulation. So we have to write sort of separate models for those. And the green ones, they are RTL-based. So they're actually using the, the real source for a device. Right? So on the far left, we have QMU. It's, you know, it can, has a lot of capacity in terms of being able to emulating large designs or large systems. Right? We can emulate a full PC. All the PCIe cards. We can even have two PCs. Or you know, we can have an x86 and an ARM. We can do very big stuff. Um, it's also very fast, right? Especially if we run in KVM mode, we can reach gigahertz uh, speed. Um, but in terms of visibility, uh, it's, it has low visibility into the actual implementation, right? Because we're using a separate model. It, that model may not even have the same state as the real hardware. But it has some visibility. I mean, if you look at the CPU, you can see the registers. If you look at device model, you can see register state. But you may not be able to see signaling within the actual block. It may also have low accuracy uh, in the sense that it's not cycle accurate and it doesn't emulate the real, or, or it doesn't have the RTL right to do the real exact thing. Um, so as we move to the right, uh, Look at system C. System C tends to move a little bit towards RTL, but it's still, if you're using the TLM uh, modeling styles, it's still very high level, right? So system C is a little bit special because the language allows you to model you know, at the RTL level or higher. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm focusing here on the TLM side. Then we have the FPGA prototyping, which is when you take the RTL and basically put it on an FPGA and you try to emulate your system that way. So that's, you know, it's quite fast, um, but it has a problem with the capacity unless you, you try to do multiple FPGAs, which people are doing. There's, you know, this um, like bigger prototyping systems that have many FPGAs, you can, you can go that way. But it, it's still like, let's say, small to medium capacity. So you can't really model, um, let's say multiple PCs or, a, or a multiple huge SOCs, right? You're, you're bound by the capacity. Uh, oh, I can see my screen here too. So the visibility is pretty good, um, but typically you, you, you need to you know, have windows for tracing. You can't see everything. So, so I put medium here, but you know, can argue about that. It's very high accuracy. It's cycle accurate, of course. It's based on the RTL. Uh, then we have the hardware emulators, which are sort of accelerated simulators. They support fairly large designs, but they are slower, right? They would go down to like the megahertz kind of speeds. Uh, they have high visibility. You can trace and get waveforms and lots of details, right? And very high accuracy. Um, and they support fairly, yeah, I said that, large designs. Right, and then we have the RTL simulation, which uh, is also a bit special here because it can actually be quite fast if you have small designs, but it tends to slow down a lot if you grow your, the stuff you're emulating or simulating. 
Okay, so what is code simulation? Yeah, code simulation is when we, instead of using one single technology to emulate or simulate things, we mix it up, right? We can, we can use, put some stuff in one technology and other stuff in another one. An example is, I have here is when we have QMU and system C and RTL co -simula RTL simulation, all together co-simulating in a full system. Uh, so we get a mix of the speeds, depending on you know, what runs where, we have a mix of speeds, capacity, visibility, and accuracy. Yeah. And, um, right, and uh, I just wanna mention here that in, uh, the way we do this is typically centered around system C because many of the tools, especially the RTL ones, they all support system C, let's say as a glue or bind, there's bindings to system C. So system C can sort of access the, the signals at the RTL level. Um, so system C is here sort of as a glue. Okay, I'll come a little bit more into that later. Okay, so I'll show a few more examples on why this can be very useful. So, so here's an example of the Xilinx uh, Versal co-simulation that's that is built into Vitis, the Vitis tool, right? So our customers that use the Versal, they they get this FPGA or SOC. That's let's say a part of it is hardened, right? The whole ARM subsystems and there's Ethernet Max, whole bunch of stuff that is hard. And then there's the programmable logic, which is where the user, you know, they write their RTL and they load it there and they run it, right? So in, in terms of simulation, they don't really care about simulating the hard stuff with very much accuracy. They care about their own RTL. And if they can get a simulator of the hardened parts that runs very fast, eh, that's great, right? So that's why we put our hard blocks into QMU uh, and then the soft blocks or the RTL goes into RTL simulation. Uh, so this way the user gets you know, high accuracy and high visibility to their own stuff, while high speed for the stuff that Silence provides. Here's another one if we, so this is also a kind of a real example from Versal development. Uh, so hooking up uh, QMU to a hardware emulator which is typically capacity bound and slower and, you know, um, by moving out some parts of the SOC to QMU, we could increase the capacity by 60%. And that means we could, for example, double the amount of users, or you could model a system that wouldn't be possible without QMU. And you can also increase the speed of test runs. Right? So if you're running software driven tests to exercise a specific RTL, in QMU, you, you now get a 240x speed up on those tests. That's pretty significant. Okay, so how do we do this bridging between the different technologies? So if we take an example here on how we do it for between QMU and System C. So we have this remote port bridge. Remote port is a protocol, like a network protocol that we can run over Unix sockets or TCP IP sockets. And really what it does, it just serializes transactions. So there's a device in QMU, a remote port device. There's multiple of them actually, but there's, for example, one for memory map transactions. And when a transaction comes in, we serialize it and move it over to system C. And on the system C side, it gets converted to a TLM generic payload and injected further into ports there, right? And we move memory map transactions both ways, wires both ways. So wires could be interrupts or any, like a reset or GPIOs, whatever, right? There's also ways to move MMU transla translations to, or requests, let's say, to support things like uh, ATS or P PCIe. There's stream transactions uh, for Axis stream, for example. Uh, we can also move network packets. And PCIe, which is more like a composition of the memory mapped and wires, but it, there's a PCIe device, remote port device in QMU that allows you to sort of emulate the PCIe endpoint on the system C side or as RTL. 
Okay, so how is bridging done between system C and RTL simulation? Well, it's a little bit different here. So on this side, we have a TLM generic payload, which is just a structure, basically, that describes a transaction. So this structure may have, you know, what address am I reading from? Uh, it may have how, my, how many bytes am I reading? Is this transaction an attribute? Is this transaction secure? What is the master ID? What are the cacheability attributes? All of that will be described in a structure. So the job of the bridge here is basically to replay that transaction uh, on the RTL signaling. So if we're talking AXI, that would mean you know, replaying the various phases of the AXI protocol, such that the RTL simulated logic would just respond. Right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so if we look at how we do it for FPGA prototyping, so in, in this case we have um, the bridge is actually RTL logic that gets synthesized into the FPGA and, and you know, sits between the DUT and, and the rest of the simulation. And the job of the RTL bridge is to replay transactions. So it gets, you configure it to replay a specific, much like I said before with the TLM generic payload, you configure all the details of a specific transaction, you know, what address, the, the width, how many beats you want, and all the attributes, and, and the bridge will go and replay it towards your DUT. And this works both ways. So if the DUT wants to DMA back into the system C environment, that also works. Okay, um, so that was a little intro to how we do those things. So if we look at, um, yeah, so the, the 2018 DARPA ran a project that they called POSH. It stands for POSH Open Source Hardware. And uh, we participated in that project, extending some of our System C frameworks. Um, and the library that mostly got worked on, there were other stuff too, uh, was the Lib System C TLM SOC library. It's a horrible name, but there you go. <laughs> um, and yeah, the idea is to use you know, open source technologies to achieve this kind of co-simulation setups that I just described. And as, I, as you see here, system C is really the, the center of things. Um, right, so in that project, we developed bridges for RTL simulation. Uh, and yeah, for a whole variety of RTL protocols. Right there all the AMBA stuff, the APB, AXI, all kinds of AXI, and all of this is open source. And it works with very later Accelera System C and, and uh, QMU. We also developed the RTL FPGA prototyping RTL and the necessary drivers for, for those, um, which are also in the library as open source. Right? And there's a whole bunch of demos and examples how to get going. So if you're interested in learning RTL and Verilog, this is a very easy way to get started, actually. Okay, so, okay, a little bit more about the setups here. So we have, in this example, we have uh, QMU at the left, for example, emulating a C, sync, sync MP, Sally sync MP. Uh, it, you know, whenever a transaction comes in to a, a memory region that targets the remote port device, that transaction will move over to, to the system CTLM side, and it'll go into the, so I refer to the POSH system C bridges here. Those are actually the, the bridges I was talking about before. And so it, it'll hit the POSH bridge, and the generic payload will get translated to RTL signaling, and the DUT will work, and this is all done with open source tools. So here's another uh, more complete setup where we have uh, two QMUs and they talk remote port between each other. And to the right, it looks the same. Okay, so here's how the FPGA prototyping works in, in more detail. So we have QMU, again, uh, let's say issuing a transaction transaction moves to the system C side and becomes a generic payload. 
the generic TLM generic payload hits the posh bridge. The posh bridge in this case is, is different because it's actually more like a driver, a VFIO driver that, that takes ownership of the posh bridge that is on the FPGA side, right? Sitting behind a, a PCIe a card, like the LVO card. Um, right, so um, so the posh bridge will, you know, via VFIO take over that posh bridge and drive it and, you know, in this case, set up the registers for a DMA transfer and move the transaction over to posh bridge, which, and the posh bridge will replay it to the DUT. Uh, the other way, on the other way, the posh bridge will pre-allocate like a ring of TLM generic payloads and all the buffers for them, and the buffers will be programmed into the POS bridge so that whenever uh, the DUT makes a DMA transaction, that transaction will be captured by the POS bridge and DMA into the uh, generic payloads, right? And signal to the POS bridge that, okay, you've got a transaction that needs to be injected. Okay, so uh, I just wanna mention here, this is a question that often comes up. Why don't you just do device pass through here? Well. Device pass-through would be super fast, but, but if you just do pass-through, you can't actually capture the DMA transactions, as an example, right? If the DUT DMAs into this simulated system and you're doing DMA pass-through, you're DMAing straight into memory. You can't capture a transaction and, for example, let's say that transaction targets an emulation model of, a, I don't know, a UART. Right. You need that transaction to get captured and re-injected into the system C as, as a TLM generic payload or, or such. Right. And the other way, um, why don't we just bridge over at the hardware level the transactions from QMU over to the DUT? Well, if you do that on PCIe, you'll lose all the attributes, right? Because PCIe may not have a trust zone, secure, non-secure bit, or it may not have a cacheability attributes. And you, you wouldn't be able to control the exact timing of the transaction, how many beats, the size, etc. So that's why you need these uh, bridges to, to give you that control. Okay, so this is one way of doing uh, the bridging for when you're using hardware emulators. Um, so when you, when you use the hardware emulator, the vendor gives you the emulator and the interface to the emulator. So it may or may not be PCIe and you may or may not have control over it. So in this case, we have to use the vendor's verification IP to move transactions. Um, right, and this one works okay, but there's some cons to it, um, one of them being that you don't have much control over the, how the AXI transactions get replayed because it's the vendor's bridge. So here's another way to do it where you use the vendor, the vendor's bridge only as infrastructure and you put the open source parts bridges sort of around it, wrapping it. Right? Now we get full control over how, what the transactions look like. Uh, the, um, con for this one is that it's slower because you're basically tunneling transactions over another channel. Okay. So I thought I was going to do a demo. We'll see if it works. So this is a demo we did at, um, uh, at the Posh, one of the Posh events. Uh, so it'll show QMU emulating the SyncMP, the silent SyncMP. We're just gonna boot the Linux there, Peta Linux. Um, on the system C side, we have the system C wrapper for the SyncMP, which basically just makes the whole remote port and QMU thing look like a ordinary system C module. It just wraps it up. Uh, we have a bunch of system C models for DMA controllers, or two of them. Um, and the green part uh, is RTL for 
for the Louis LMAC. So the LMAC was an Ethernet controller de developed in the POSH program as well. It's open source. It's on GitHub, you can go find it. So we've used very later to, to make that system C compatible, we can say, yeah, or convert it to system C. Yeah, but it's R RTL still at the RTL level. So we're gonna use the POSH bridges to connect that into a full system simulation. Uh, we have a virtual phi, which is an interesting module here. It basically, um, so I mentioned before, we have remote port net devices. So those are, uh, it's basically a network, like a network interface em emulated in QMU, but all the packets that go in and out of it go over remote port to system C as, as generic payloads. So now on the system C side, we get all the ethernet traffic and we can send and receive off live off the internet, right? And we have this little virtual file that takes a generic payload in, the, in one direction and replace the RTL signaling of uh, GMII and the other way, the reverse, right? So now we can talk to the Mac. The Mac thinks it's just talking to a file, but it's all going via QMU out on the internet live. Okay, so look how this goes. Okay, I hope you can read a little bit. Let's see, so I'm gonna start the system C side here. Then I'm running QMU on the left window. Okay, so let's see, it should have discovered the um, LMAC. Yeah, there it is. So I'm gonna go and uh, take down the, the first ethernet interface because that's the built-in, the hard one in the CU plus. I'm taking that down and I'm gonna instead bring up the LMAC one. So yeah, now the LMAC is up and we got an address. Uh, I can go ahead and just download something. Right, so that's pretty fast. And it's the Ethernet Mac is now RTL simulated, right? And as you can see, it works pretty well for software, you know, fast enough for doing software development. Just gonna SSH back into the host. pretty responsive. Okay, and I can still do all the usual stuff, like I'm gonna connect GDB, let's see. I have a breakpoint on the receive interrupt, continue. And I'm gonna remove the, do the download again, and I'm gonna see that hit, right? Um, so I can, you know, do the usual debugging when developing drivers. Okay, let's see, I'm just gonna let this continue. Okay, I'm gonna stop this. Okay, so another um, um, cool thing with this is QMU has this feature where you can dump all the network traffic into a PCAP trace, which we can then analyze with Wireshark. So if you're debugging Ethernet stuff, yeah, you can also look at these traces, right? And this gives you pretty good visibility. And now that we have uh, an RTL simulated Ethernet Mac, we can also go down and look at the signaling. So I selected a couple of signals here. This is not all of them, but let me see. I don't know if this will be visible for you. But... Okay, anyway, what we have here is we basically have the clock so we can see what happens at each clock cycle. We have the, the wires between the Phi, the emulated Phi and the Ethernet Mac. So we can see for each cycle, we see, for example, here we have the idle sequences on the data lanes. Then we have a preamble and the packet starts. Uh, and then we see each and every beat for each clock cycle until the 
line goes idle again, right? Then there's a little bit of nothing happens. The Mac is processing the packet. And then we see the AXI stream interface from the Ethernet Mac to the DMA controller. Um, and we see data for each cycle. We see the, you know, the valid signal every beat until the T last gets set, signaling this is the last beat of this transaction. Uh, we see the, the strobes, like the byte enables, basically. Yeah. OK, so that's really neat, because now you get the full visibility, right? Um, so if you find an issue, you can track it down. You can even see all the signaling within the Ethernet Mac uh, for each and every cycle, right? OK, uh, where am I here? I lost the, OK, anyway, that was my last slide. So I guess we can take questions now. No questions? Right, okay, so, I, yeah, I, right. Okay, so the question is, uh, Paolo was saying here that the, typically the, the machine models in QMU for embedded devices are very static. Um, I think what you mean is also that there, there's no structured bus to sort of hot plug and connect things into, right. Um, and uh, how we do things to, to be, a, yeah to compose the machine, basically. Yeah, so we have um, a, a, some patches to QMU, to our QMU, which we've tried to upstream in several forms, but still no success yet, that essentially take in a, a device tree file that describes the machine for us. Um, right now, you can argue that device tree is not the best format, and yes and no. We don't actually use the same device tree let's say, um, the bindings that the kernel does. So we have different, we have more of a one-to-one -one mapping between device tree and QOM. So every node is a QOM object. Every DTS property gets set as if it was a QOM property, right? There's some exceptions to that, but um, that's essentially how we, how we do it. And we have a way to, you know, take the GPIOs or the reset signals and the interrupts and put it together and compose the machine. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? Would the project that I can readily check out with the static integration between Veronica and QEMO and from, from starting point? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a version of the demo I just showed. Um, let me see if yeah, so it's a version of this demo, but it uses a risk five um, CPU right and there's basically a readme file to walk you through each step uh, to reproduce this. So yeah, there are demos yes. there are many demos without QMU just doing the system C um, co-simulating with RTL. That's a good place to get started. Yeah. QMU would be another add-on, but yeah, there are, there's plenty of documentation. Also on the Silings wiki pages, there's documentation. Right, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So the question is, 
And typically when you, when you do co-simulation, you mix these technologies, right? You get a difference in speed by nature. And how do you deal with that really? Because, uh, right, and, and there's several ways to handle it. Uh, one way is to let them, just let them run at different times, free running them, decouple them, and let them run freely. And we find that's the most popular way. But there are other ways too. You can do, uh, so we have another mode where we run QMU in I count mode, um, which has a lot of penalty, but anyway, you can do that. And then you get a sense of some timing. Uh, and we can then run the system C side sort of in lockstep with that. Um, that allows you, with RTL simulation, you can get some kind of lockstepping. Uh, now with the FPGA prototyping, we don't have a way to do any of that today. So it's all free running. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah, now so we, with very later, and uh, I'm sure the, the property or the commercial vendors have features like that, but with very later, we cannot do that on the RTL side. But you can do it on the software, if you do it software driven, you can sort of single step the CPU. And if, you, if you're running lockstep, like if we go back to his question, then you can actually sort of single step the CPU and you will get one instructions worth of RTL execution, right? And you can. Sort of step. Right. No, you can't. No. So that would be a great feature, in, or, or I'm not aware of such a feature at least. Speaking of this system, I think that QMU owns the memory, and how do you manage the parents if you have generated some size? Right. So in in uh, there's several ways to do that, but typically the DMA goes back into QMU, right? There's another setup that we use sometimes where the system seed side can do a shared mapping of all the memory. So QMU, um, I think this feature is also available in upstream now. You can set up so QMU generates files for each RAM and those files can then be opened by another application and shared, basically shared memory mapped across, right? And then both applications can write to the memory. So that is used in some scenarios to get speed a little bit, yeah, get better speed. Um, so we used to have an issue though, if you were trying to do like atomic instructions across remote port, that could be problematic. But I think maybe today, I actually haven't tried it because it's not really a use case that shows up for us, since we tend to emulate like the, a, let's say the Cortex A clusters, they are all in QMU, right? We don't split them up. Or, uh, but there may be other scenarios where you need the atomic instructions, but I guess maybe with uh, the empty TCG and that we now actually emit something for the atomic, for the memory barriers, then possibly it works. I haven't tried it. Okay, looks like we are done. Okay, thank you very much, guys.